which I would uh, like to congratulate all of my colleagues on their new or returning roles. I take the opportunity to thank the people of the Kenora Riding for placing their trust in me to serve. Thank you to all my volunteers and my campaign team who worked so hard to make this possible, and a special mention to my good friends and family for supporting me along the way. My parents, Joe and Charlene, who have always been there to help, and to my partner, Danica, who has shown tremendous strength in adjusting to the challenges that public life presents. Thank you for your support. Mr. Speaker, many people in my writing have shared concerns about about this throne speech and how it will impact northwestern Ontario. My riding is rather unique. It is the largest in Ontario by land mass and it is the smallest by population. It is home to many First Nations and municipalities, each with very different localized concerns. Madam Speaker, there are many challenges that we face in this region, from access to health and social services to broadband internet and a way of life that has been under attack by this Liberal government. But there are also many opportunities in this region. For example, people from all around the globe choose the Kenora Riding as a tourist destination each year. Madam Speaker, I happen to know that my good friend, the member from York Simcoe, is often one of them. And across all sectors, there's untapped economic potential and resilient citizens that are working hard to see our region grow. When we talk about growth, Madam Speaker, and economic potential, Residents in my riding want to see a responsible government spending plan that is focused on attracting investment and lowering the deficit. However, this, go this government is unfortunately continuing with their high tax and reckless spending plan, which has Canada lagging behind others in the G7. Madam Speaker, we in the Kenora riding feel those effects with many businesses that are struggling to get off the ground or closing up shop, and dwindling industry, which is resulting in jobs and opportunities leaving the riding. With that in mind, I was particularly concerned to see that there's very little support for the natural resource sector in the speech from the throne. There's no hope provided to miners in Red Lake and across my region, and there is absolutely no mention of softwood lumber or our forest forestry industry. In fact, Madam Speaker, there's actually a plan that will restrict forest access even further. Conservatives understand that sustainable forest management and resource management more broadly plays a pivotal role in growing our economy, protecting our environment, and providing a more prosperous future for the next generation. Madam Speaker, I, I, I spoke very briefly earlier about our way of life, and I must mention that firearms are an important tool for people in my riding in their way of life. Whether it's law-abiding sport shooters that are belonging to a gun club, or hunters that rely on their firearms to feed their families, this is an issue that unites people from all walks of life in my riding. I've even heard from many people who don't actually own firearms, Madam Speaker, but they are concerned that this overreach, that this government's proposed blanket ban and confiscation of firearms from everyday Canadians will not be beneficial. And the experts all agree that this ban will not do anything to combat the very important issue of gun crime and gang violence in our cities. In fact, in my riding, it may make rural and remote Canadians feel less safe. I was recently in Fort Severn First Nation, Madam Speaker. This is the most northern community in Ontario, and it sits right along the edge of Hudson's Bay. This community is only accessible by plane, by barge, or by an ice road when the proper weather conditions permit. The people of this community rely on their firearms to provide for their families, especially given the disproportionately higher cost of living that they face. But they also rely on these firearms to protect themselves from the threats of bears and other dangerous wild animals which live near, but more often, within the community. I've spoken with these residents directly, Madam Speaker, and they are worried that the ambiguous term military-style firearm may lead to them losing their guns and actually jeopardize their way of life and their safety. The Liberals have yet to provide us their definition of what military style means, but I believe that Canadians deserve to know exactly what that is so we can know what the government's intentions are and have a thoughtful, fact-based debate about how we can best combat gun violence. To put it simply, Madam Speaker, we must focus on criminals and not law-abiding hunters and sports shooters. Rural and remote communities also face unique challenges when it comes to internet access. A lack of reliable, high-speed internet hinders the ability of rural Canadians to access information, receive services, and compete in the Canadian economy. 
rural broadband access must be prioritized so that our students, workers, and business owners can participate equally in society. I was disappointed, as were many in the Kenora riding, that the throne speech made no mention of rural connectivity. Many of my constituents felt ignored by this throne speech. I believe, Madam Speaker, that I've made that very clear in my remarks so far. However, I was very glad to hear that reconciliation will be a priority for this government. First Nations and Northern communities in my riding are underfunded, they are under-resourced. The people in these communities need access to health and social services. They need infrastructure investments to fix water systems and mold-infested homes. And they need access to medical, mental health, and addictions treatments. I hope to be able to work productively with the government to secure real results for these communities in my riding. This is unfortunately one of the files, Madam Speaker, where this government has been all talk with very little action. But I do believe, I do believe that in this minority parliament, we have a tremendous opportunity to work collaboratively and deliver meaningful supports. And I must say, Madam Speaker, I, Madam, Speaker, Madam Speaker, I would like to take the opportunity to say to the Minister of Indigenous Services that I look forward to uh, working together to achieve practical, practical results. And I appreciate his advocacy and collaboration on important issues to my writing. And I hope we will continue this positive working relationship into the future. Madam Speaker, this speech also makes mention of one important thing to me ambitious infrastructure investments. And I sincerely hope, and I will be urging the government, to ensure that the twinning of the Trans-Canada Highway from the Manitoba border through my riding of Kenora will be a top <coughs> priority. This is a local issue for us, but it is also a national issue, Madam Speaker. When there is a crash on the Trans-Canada Highway in my riding, our entire co economy shuts down. Our country is literally split into two. And these condi highway conditions are notoriously dangerous. So this project is tremendously important for the safety of all travelers. The construction will also reduce barriers to economic activity in the region and allow for further future development. Madam Speaker, we must ensure that we have funding from all levels of government in order to get this project done. Madam Speaker, I will conclude my remarks there, but before I yield my time, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share with this House some of my thoughts and some of my constituents' concerns with the speech from the throne. I believe that the priorities of Northwestern Ontario can and should be much better represented in this throne speech and in this government's agenda. My riding and my region have great potential, but this Parliament must be able to work constructively to deliver the necessary support and investment to get the region moving again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question de commentaire, l'honorable député de Sorel. Oh, je le sais presque pas. L'honorable député. Pardon. Non, attendez, attendez, je vais y arriver. Pourquoi? Bécancourt, Nicolas Sorel. Désolé. Avec le temps, Madame la Présidente, ça va venir, ça va venir. Euh, J'ai écouté attentivement le discours de mon honorable confrère. Euh, je partage euh, beaucoup de son point de vue. Cependant, ce qui oui, m'a surpris, c'est lorsqu'il a parlé euh, du problème euh, des forêts, en disant que le gouvernement était très peu généreux envers les compagnies forestières et envers le développement de ce secteur euh, névralgique dans son coin du nord de l'Ontario. Mais je me rappelle une chose, c'est que dans la crise de 2008, le gouvernement conservateur avait décidé de mettre 10 milliards pour sauver l'industrie de l'automobile, avec raison. 10 milliards en prêts qui n'ont jamais été remboursés pour Chrysler, par exemple, 4 milliards. La dette a été effacée. Euh, pour General Motors, on avait acheté des actions. On, on a revendu des actions à perte. Mais pour ce qui est des forêts, à ce moment-là, où il y avait également une crise énorme, le gouvernement conservateur n'avait mis que 75 millions. Et pourtant, 600 000 travailleurs dans le domaine de la forêt et 400 000 dans le domaine de l'automobile. Donc, euh, n'avez-vous pas l'impression, Monsieur le député, que le Parti libéral continue la politique du Parti conservateur? 
Honorable député de Canora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my uh, colleague uh, for his, uh, his comment. Um, in regards to 2008, I will not speak to that specifically. Madam Speaker, I was only 10 years old in 2008. <laughs> However, what I do know, what I do know is that this government's plan to restrict uh, forestry access even further is going to make it much more difficult for the forestry workers and the industry in my region. Over on this side of the House, Conservatives understand that responsible forestry management will actually help us reduce uh, carbon emissions by planting new trees, sequestering more carbon, and uh, it will provide good jobs for people in my riding and across the country. So I hope to be able to work with all parties in this House to support the forestry sector. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good job. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I congratulate my colleague on his uh, um, maiden speech uh, in the House today. I think it, he said that it was his first speech, so uh, congratulations on that. Um, I know that uh, he spent some time talking about firearms and this government's plan with respect to firearms. Uh, what we've been talking about is banning uh, military assault uh, uh, weapons. weapons. The reality of the situation is, is we don't believe that people need to be walking around or to, to have the ability to own uh, firearms that, have the, uh, that are designed to kill people. Now, I know that there are a lot of people out there that say, well, these are already banned, but, they're, but a lot of them aren't actually banned, Madam Speaker. They're just restricted. And there's a difference between being banned and being restricted. But the bottom line is that we're saying people don't need to have these weapons. And a lot of uh, hunters will say the same thing. My father-in-law is a hunter. Uh, most of the, my uncles are hunters. And they will say the exact same thing. I'm hunting. I don't need uh, a military-style weapon to, be, to, to do that, to hunt for sport. I'm wondering if the member would agree uh, that the vast majority of law-abiding uh, citizens who use firearms in a, in a law-abiding way for sport or for recreational purposes would agree with that, with that fact that these those style uh, weapons are not required. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my, uh, uh, my colleague for that comment and the question. However, I wish I could answer it, but this government has refused to tell us what they mean when they say military-style assault weapons. Right. Madam Speaker, it's a very ambiguous term and it is creating a lot of unease uh, with people across Canada, as I mentioned, uh, from the sports shooters to the, the people that rely on uh, on these firearms to provide for their families. Uh, the Conservative Party will always stand on the side of law-abiding firearms owners. We surely understand that creating more laws for people that already follow the rules will do nothing to combat this very important issue. Thank you. Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for... Uh, sorry? Piss River Russell, thank you. Or as I like to call it, the Where'd promised land, Madam Speaker. I, I want to congratulate my honorable colleague for his great uh, first speech in the House here. And I, I just was wondering if he could outline a little bit how the carbon tax is uh, affecting uh, people where he lives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honorable member for Kenora. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to my, uh, my colleague for uh, the question. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no debate that the carbon tax has hit northwestern Ontario, and my riding of Kenora particularly uh, hard. Uh, we've seen raises in the cost of living uh, all, all across the region. But uh, going back, Madam Speaker, to my visit to Fort Severn, uh, is a community where uh, the cost of everything has been even more inflated and even more drastic. So uh, this, we're going to continue to fight for a more affordable life for all Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker.